Hi everybody. Today we're just going to do a time waster video. I'm waiting for my kids to come home from college for the holiday season. Uh, we're getting real close to uh, to Christmas time and all that, so I thought I would take some time tonight and sit at the bench and build one of these little Tesla coil kits that I found online. It was kind of interesting looking in that the first thing I noticed is it had a toroid on the top in the picture online. And when I got this thing, lo and behold, look what these things are. These are actually the little trim pieces, the little flanges that go around a water pipe. So if you have a water pipe coming up through the floor, going up to your sink or, or your fixtures, this one of these would go down over it to kind of cover up the ugly hole in the floor. That's what these things are. And all they did was they took two of them, they're chrome plated, you can see that it's hollow, and they just wrapped it with some chrome tape and made a really cheap <laughs> makeshift, I, I, this is not exactly what I'd call a toroid, but I mean a little top capacitor for the output coil here of this Tesla coil. The other thing that looked interesting about it was for spark gaps, they use these two little, and they're, they're two different breakdown voltages. These are spark arresters. I've never really seen these used as a spark gap for a Tesla coil before. Most of them will have just, you know, two little electrodes that are adjustable, or they'll have a rotary spark gap, or they'll have some sort of an electronic non-spark gap, like a commutator, like either a vacuum tube or a MOSFET or something. So I thought this was different enough that I thought it'd be interesting to build. It did not come with instructions, but it did come with this silly little thing. And you can scan, you could probably stop your camera right now, stop the video, and scan this with your phone and go to this web page yourself, but there's the actual website if you want to just type it in. And it says, read first, use you phone scan the QR code or type the website to your browser to get the instruction. And enjoy the DIY. So I'm certainly going to try to enjoy the DIY. <laughs> While we do this, I thought we would do a solder and chat session. And maybe what we'll get into a little bit is on a previous video, I found a little label on, uh, well, let me go get it, hold on. So Phillips Medical Systems out of Holland uh, have several offices here in the United States, and they were closing one of their offices uh, near where I live. And I was really good friends with uh, the service manager and several of the engineers there. And when they went to close down, they were told to just purge all the old stuff inventory that's no longer relevant, end of life equipment, just get rid of it. So they asked me if I was interested in purchasing it at a really bargain basement price, which it really was. And I said, sure. And in that just truckload of parts that I bought, they had this little fuse holder in a bag and it had this little tag with it and it had the word polytome on it. And boy, did that bring back a bunch of memories and I showed it to all of you in that video and asked you if any of you would know what that was. And of course, if you try to look that up on the internet, you might find a couple little things, but there's really very, very little information. And uh, so we're going to talk about just what polytome is all about. And maybe we'll get into a little bit of history of tomography. And that's what we're going to do in this video. Like I said, just total time waster, having fun. Uh, this is not some instructional thing. This is not a repair of a, of a stereo or anything. So if, if you're not into this sort of stuff, um, I have some other audio ones coming up. So wait for those. And if not, you want to waste some time with Tony today? All right. Stay tuned. Okay. I don't know how good this is going to show up on the camera, but I'm on that web page. And if I scroll down here a little bit, let's see what we can find. So there's all kinds of information on this website. And a lot of the projects that they show here 
are absolutely not the ones that we're working on now. I think this is part of it, <laughs> but if you look, they talk a little bit about these two spark, spark arresters, and they show some of the things you can do with this, and they show you a general picture of what these are. But you can see this is kind of, this is where it actually starts with the assembly instructions. So we're going to go and begin with this here and I'm just going to, if you want to follow along, you can open another web page maybe and call up that website that I just showed you on that, on that little sticker that came with this thing. And you can go to this page and kind of follow along with what I'm doing. And I'm going to kind of half follow it and half not follow it. <laughs> We're just playing around. Again, this is just a time waster and some fun. All right, let's start to make some festive holiday sparks. So the first thing I want to do is I want to just get an idea of what this secondary coil is like. So this is actually the business end of a Tesla coil. This is going to be the part that... Uh, We'll make the arcs and sparks, and I want to kind of I want to see if we can figure out what the resonant frequency is of this coil, at least roughly. We're not going to get an exact, but let's see if we can find my dip, grid dip meter, and let's see if we can check it out with one of those. Okay, I don't have a functioning old vacuum tube grid, grid dip meter. I need to restore one, but this is a more modern solid-state version. And for any of you who have never seen a grid dip meter before, believe it or not, this is uh, this doesn't have a grid to dip because <laughs> it's not vacuum tube. But they call it a dip meter because what you're looking at is when you reach the resonant frequency of the coil that you're coupling to, you'll see this meter will dip. And at the trough of that dip, if you look on the, the little scale up here, it should let you it should tell you approximately what the resonant frequency is of that coil. And you don't want to direct couple it. Like we're not hooking any wires up here at all. You're loosely coupling it. So all it just has to be in proximity of the coil like this. So let's turn this on and we'll turn it up ugh, right about there. And I have the coil that's going to, I have the orange coil, which is this one right up here. And I don't know how well you can see that. Yeah, I'm in there pretty good. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for the area where this meter dips down. I'm going to move all the metal objects away from that. Okay, I have the meter coupled up here. Let's turn it on. We're going to just set it to about the 0.8 area. And I'm all the way down, and I'm on the three, what is it, three to eight, yeah, 3.5 to eight megahertz range, which is going to be this orange band right here. And if we go down here, and what we're looking for, the reason this is called a dip meter, is because we're going to look for an area where this needle right here dips and then comes back up. And at the trough of that dip, we're going to read that scale up there, and that's going to give us a general idea of what the frequency is. Now, if I get this coil too close or too far away, it's not coupled properly, it'll be hard to read. If you get it too closely coupled, like if I put this clear inside here, chances are what's going to happen is you're going to get all kinds of reflections, and you'll get multiple peaks. It won't read right. So you, there's kind of a fine line between too close and too far. But once you get it in the right area, which I think this should be pretty close, um, we should be able to get a good dip on this, and that'll tell us where we are. Now, of course, if we put our hand over it or put any metal object around it, that will affect the resonant frequency of that coil. So this is not going to tell us the exact resonant frequency, but it'll at least get us in the ballpark, so we'll know roughly what band we're going to be interfering on <laughs> with this stupid thing when it's built. So we're coming down, 
and see the needles just now starting to drop there it is there's your dip if I go through it, it comes back up again right right around there that's whoop you have to get it right on that area okay so now let's zoom down and I'm going to use the camera to see if we can read this and if you look let's get straight on here we're on the orange band if this thing will focus for us there we go and you can see right here is 5 megahertz and each little dash is 0.2 megahertz or 200 kilohertz so it's just around 5.2 megahertz just a little over over that see 6 megahertz is over here so it's about 5.2 5.25 megahertz and that's the resonant frequency of the coil now if I get it back into that dip area and I put my hand on it you can see what happens it changes if I put this here on it see how it changes so you can't have anything around there when you're testing this so right there's your dip okay so about 5.25 megahertz we'll call it all right now we know by the way just to promote somebody else that I have no affiliation with and I don't personally know but I've been watching his videos for years Alan over at W2AEW uh, YouTube channel uh, he is a true engineer uh, and he's not me <laughs> he is a real engineer who truly does this stuff for a living and knows what he's doing and he did a excellent video on grid dip meters uh, it's probably a better part of five to ten year old video now but if you scroll through his or go to search his channel you can learn more about what a grid dip meter is and some of the things you can do beyond what we just did so check him out very 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 cool dude all right so the first thing they want us to do is it looks like they want us to put this foam strip on here as a backer for the capacitors so I'm going to do that so to quote what they're saying on the constructions foam is buffered at bottom and what they're showing is they're just showing an image of putting the foam one little piece here and one little piece up here and that's to just put a little bit of separation between the circuit board and the circuitry itself so we're gonna go maybe right about there I don't think this is super critical I'm gonna attach this right here and I think they want that to be in such a way that they don't want it to cover these two little wires here so I'm just gonna snip just a wee little bit off of there like so There we go. Put this on here. So yeah, like I said, we're going to maybe later on here in the video, we're going to talk about tomography. What is tomography? Well, the most common type that you will all run into these days, if you ever have to have a study done, would be CT or CAT which stands for computerized, computerized axial tomography or MRI which is magnetic resonance imaging which is also a, a form of tomography but really all, of, all the definition of tomography is is when you're looking at a image like a radiograph or some sort of internal image of the body on a single plane so 
the, the earliest types were called linear tomography and or focal focal point tomo or focal plane tomography that's what they were called so we'll get into that here in a little bit let's dig out the rest of these parts let's see what they are because the next thing they want is they want this capacitor to be mounted in the little capacitor area and we'll we want to put this out so that we can see what value this is for future reference so I'm going to make sure that this is this way and let's get our cutters and our pliers go like that and like that. It should kind of get it in the general area where we want it. Like I said, this is just a fun project. I'm not going to get crazy with it. All right. And I do have the overhead light off. Let me know how the lighting looks like this. I want to try this out. Uh, it makes it easier for me to see the monitor on the computer if I'm doing something where I'm using my computer monitor. But I'm thinking it may also give a little bit of better lighting effect for you all looking through the camera. So let me know down in the comments what you think of it, of this kind of view, and because sometimes I can do this. Other times I need the overhead light. But this one here, you know, instances like this, it's actually more convenient for me to have that light off. There we go. Just got that on. Now, what are they going to call for next? I'm going to bring this down where I can move it a little easier. Okay. Now they want us to do the transformer coil needs to be installed according to the picture and the rough copper wire is the primary position. Please look at the annotation on the picture. And what they're showing is so they want us to take All right, so if we hold this in this direction and we put the coil this way, they want it oriented so that the wire right here, this little end winding, goes to this terminal. If I flip it this way, you'll see the wire is on the left. They want it so that the wire is on the right, like that. And then they want that facing this direction. So that's what we're going to do, just like that. And that's what they're looking for. So let me get that in. Isn't this fun? I hope you all know what a Tesla coil is. I think it was one of the things that got me fascinated by in, the, in electronics so early. I started playing with electronics when I was nine years old. I know that sounds kind of silly, but I really did. And one of the things that inspired me beyond uh, two of my cousins who were already into electronics that were older than me was that uh, my brother-in-law and my sister Actually, no, it was even longer ago. This was like, this was many years ago. My sister and her boyfriend at the time, uh, we went to a science center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And they had a very large, and when I say large, I mean, you know, taller than a person, you know, probably meters tall 
Tesla coil. It was very large. It had a big uh, pole transformer off of a you know off of a utility pole for mains and wired backwards. Great big oil filled capacitors. And when they lit that thing up, it threw it threw an arc six seven feet. <laughs> it was ear shatteringly loud. Back then, you could be in the room with it when it was operating. They didn't, you know, they didn't put you, you, you just stood behind a, you know, a rope. <laughs> Things weren't quite as uh, safety oriented as they are today. And I, I was hooked. I, I wanted to do electronics. So ever since then, I've liked, I've been interested in Tesla coils. I built a larger sized one myself many many years ago when I still lived at home got in a lot of trouble with my parents and everything because all the noise that it created and everything and what a Tesla coil is is this is a resonant transformer so the whole purpose of this circuit here is to drive this coil at the frequency we just measured on that grid dip meter so if we can put pulses into this coil in a rhythmic pattern at exactly the resonant frequency of this coil, something pretty cool is going to happen. What's going to happen is this coil is going to have a very high gain and it's going to output a very, very high voltage. So even though we may only be putting 12 volts into this circuit to begin with, there are going to be many thousands of volts coming out of this little coil. And some of the larger ones can output even into the millions of volts. So it's pretty amazing how these things work. All right, next step. Okay, the next thing they want is, they just want to show you how it is. High voltage diode. So now they want the diode. And that's going to, let's take a little tray out so that we don't lose all this stuff. This stuff has a tendency to disappear. And this looks like the high voltage diode to me. Let's take a look and see what the breakdown voltage is. Okay, we're going to look both at the forward voltage drop and then we're probably not going to see the reverse voltage on this because it's definitely going to be a lot higher than 323 volts. So the first thing I want to do is let's look at the forward voltage drop. And you can see it has a forward drop of about 37 volts. And that tells us that this is a high voltage diode. High voltage rectifiers will have a much higher forward voltage drop than a regular diode. So if we look at, uh, let's see if I can find a 1N4007. Let's see. Do I have one? Yes, I do have one. I don't want to go into the, to the bins because that's a pain in the butt. Okay, so here's a cheap. 1N4007. If we look at the forward drop on this one, you can see it's about 0.7 volts. And if I go in reverse voltage, it won't read. It'll read the full 323 because the reverse voltage on this is higher than 300 volts. And this is going to be the same way, so it's not going to read backwards. But the forward drop will give you an idea that this is a true high voltage diode because most of them will have a higher forward drop. Some of these diodes are actually just multiple uh, like 1000 volt diodes in series. And that's what gives it the high reverse uh, breakdown voltage that a high voltage diode needs. So this is just a good way to check that. All right, let's get this mounted up. you get these kits from China, you don't always know <laughs> if they're telling you the truth about things or not. You just never know what they put in these kits. 
usually I have pretty good luck with them though. I'll be honest. Uh, I know there's a lot of things floating around the internet of people saying shady stuff and there's actually been some videos that people are showing uh, the shady things that were out there. But uh, I've had fairly good luck. Uh, every now and then you'll get a bad component or something but if you have a spare you're okay. If you don't have a spare then that, that is a problem. All right, there we go. Trim these off a little bit. We'll get them soldered in there. Okay. All right. That's good, next step. Okay, the next thing they want is the LED and its dropping resistor. And they say, lead long foot is plus. I like that. So what they're saying is the, the longer lead is your pot goes to your positive terminal. So we're gonna go in here where it says LED and you can see where it says plus down here. I can maybe zoom you down a little bit, huh? go and we'll put this on now whenever you're doing LEDs it's usually a good idea to not leave the soldering iron on there for a very long time that's called dwell time how long you keep the iron on the solder joint because LEDs don't like a lot of heat so We definitely don't want uh, don't want to leave that on there a real long time. And I'm going to leave the leads long on this, and those will help carry some of the heat away. And that gives us a better chance of being successful and not frying our LED. So you just get on there, get it on, get it soldered, and get off. And we're going to give that a little snip. And there is your LED circuit. Okay, next they want us to put the button. And they want the button and they want the power jack. So there's the power jack, here is the button. Here is the little cover for the button. And they want us to just attach that. And I don't think this one, no, it really doesn't care. I don't see a, I'm looking to see if there's any angled corners that would indicate the that it's a polarized direction, but it's not. So we're good there. And they want us to put this in. Hold those and we'll get them bent over. Okay. Let's just do this one first and then we'll put that other one in there. This one you don't want to leave on there too long either because you don't want to melt the plastic on this. Just like so. There we go. Looks good. And we drop the switch on the floor. So let's see if I can step on it when I step down to pick it up. And where did it go? The part-eating floor strikes again. 
I heard it. I felt it bounce. And it is gone. All right, stand by. Tony has to go spelunking for parts once again. Okay, I am back from the depths of the floor. Let's put this back on. Bend these two pins so that it will stay in place a little bit. And I will solder that. I'm just going to heat this up. All right, make sure it's flush against the face of the circuit board. There we go. Nice. Okay. Now that those two parts are on, Igniter socket. Okay. I'm having a hard time seeing what they're calling the igniter socket. Is that this thing? I'm assuming. Yes. So they want this to go here. And I think this is the, they're just making a set of sockets. So we can attach our spark gap. I think that's what they were talking about. Hard to tell. Okay, you can see. Once I get this side in, then I can. It'll hold itself, and we can finish it up. We can sit it down. I haven't mastered the big Clive three finger solder holding technique that I envy him being able to do so much. But okay. Looks good. Let's see what we have here. That's the only downside of this. When I pick this up, it gets above the light, <laughs> the little projector lights that I'm, the little spotlights I'm using, and it makes it look dark. Okay, next thing, they want us to put the igniter, as they're calling it, and there's two different versions, and it says uh, there's a 2RK3000 and a 2RK3500 and what that means is that one of these will arc over at 3 kilovolts, the other one at 3.5 kilovolts and what they want you to do is try both of them and see which one gives you the best results. So I'm going to start with the 3.5 kilovolt arc unit they want it to be attached, looking at this, to these two outer pins, like so. And actually, they want you to snip it down, so they don't even want these to be up too high. So I'm going to just take a little bit off of them. And these are non-polarized. They're just spark gaps is what they are inside there. And if some of you don't understand what I'm talking about with Tesla coils and spark gaps and resonant transformers and all this, there are many, many websites. I think the Tesla coil is one of the most fascinating pieces of electronic gear out there. And people, everybody wants to build a Tesla coil and talk about so if you go online and you try to look it up, you'll find many, many, many different... I've been talking with this microphone hanging from this wire for the last, I don't know how long. But let's repeat it. So this is 
a 3,500 volt spark gap or igniter as they're calling it and this is a 3,000 volt igniter and you can just see how they have uh, the numbers on them. This one's 3,500. And I'm starting with the 3,500 and as I was saying earlier if you don't know what I'm talking about with spark gaps and capacitors and Tesla coils and resonant transformers and all this go online and look up Tesla coil. Uh, Wikipedia, uh, many many YouTube channels, many dedicated websites. The Tesla coil is one of the most popular pieces of electronic high voltage gear out there. It fascinates people with how they work and the sparks they give off and all that. Uh, they sometimes call them lightning generators and all that. And I have a feeling this may, well yeah this is a true Tesla coil because it's using a spark gap and a capacitor and a type of tank circuit. Um, and so using a little step up power supply. Some of them are not actually Tesla coils. They are called Slayer Exciter coils and they're a little bit different because the primary circuit, how it works, is a little bit different and the, the tank circuit is a little different. It's self-regulating and it's self-resonating so it's a new and improved version. But this is more of a traditional Tesla coil so you have to fiddle around with this spark gap because that spark gap is what adjusts the amount of timing of those little high voltage pulses that we're going to drive into this coil to reach that resonant frequency. So that's what we're doing. All right. And here is our little module. And these are two IRFZ44N MOSFETs. This is a 7805 voltage regulator. So they're taking your 12 volts coming into this and outputting and uh, dropping it down to regulated 5 volts and then this is an inverter and this is going to generate a higher frequency and that frequency is what's going to drive this coil here and that's going to give us our primary high voltage. So this is probably going to be somewhere in the line of you know 3 to 5,000 volts, something like that, 5 kV, very, very low current. It will still give you a big zap. And then that's going to be fed into the tank circuit, which is the capacitor and the, the uh, spark gap, or the igniter as they call it. We'll get more into what this is later once it's built. We'll talk a little more about the parts and we'll look at a little, just a basic schematic of it. Now I have a piece of yellow wire that they gave me and a piece of red wire and they're showing all four wires just being orange so I think they just give you random wire <laughs> and uh, you just use it. Uh, I have a feeling that they probably will have us use the other piece of wire for something else so I'm just going to use this one piece. You only need a little tiny bit. You don't need a whole lot of wire because I think what they're going to have us do is they're going to have us feed the 12 volts into here. Let's make sure this capacitor is the right value. Yeah, it's a 50 volt cap, so it's more than enough to handle that. And then they come out of here and go into the step up transformer circuit. And I don't think they really care what order that goes. There is no plus and minus. So. So really what they're going to do is we're going to go from here just to up here, which is not a big deal. Okay. So we just need just a couple inches of wire for each one. Boy, that wire is thin, thin, thin. It is solid wire though, instead of stranded. I guess that's a good thing. Okay, so they left the lead of the capacitor sticking through a little bit so we can kind of use that as a binding post. And I'm going to just take this, I'm gonna take advantage of that. 
And you know what? I'm having tr trouble seeing, so let me put the overhead light on. I don't know. I have a feeling that you're all going to say you like it better with the overhead light because looking on the camera, it looks just looks a little clearer. I mean, the camera was making up for the lower light level, but I just think, at least from looking at it through the viewfinder, the image looks a little clearer this way. So, let me know what you think. There's one. I'm going to let this video roll because it's a time waster. So we'll waste time with it. And if you want to skip ahead or not watch it at all or whatever you want to do, um, I think you'll it'll work out either way for you. So. Perfect. So we got those in. I really don't like them being that close together. Of course, this is only 12 volts DC, but I think I am going to put a tiny little piece of heat shrink on there. Matter of fact, I'll put a nice piece of heat sink on heat shrink on there, and that'll just help the wires be a little bit more stiff and less prone to tear to melting or whatever. Let's give it a little shrink. This doesn't come with it, but I'm sure you don't have to do this if you don't want to. Okay. And then I may put that on the high voltage end as well. That may help us with that. Okay. And before we put that on, we're going to go ahead and uh, put these, uh, these other two wires on. So we want one going around here, and we'll make it about this length. And one's going to be a short one because it doesn't really have to go that far. Okay. Nothing like the sound of washing machines. Washing machines and furnaces. Okay. All right, if you want to fall out, I'll leave you out till I get this one done. Am I still even in frame? Well, kind of. You get to looking at the bench so much, you don't look at the viewfinder. You have to kind of remember to look up there once in a while. Okay. So this one I'm not going to cover. This one I am going to put a little piece of heat shrink on. Again, I don't think that's very high voltage at all, but just in case, we will put that on there. We'll give it a little shrink. All right. Okay. So the plus goes over to here, and the minus goes over to here, so they kind of cross over one another. So I'm going to do this. I'll strip this one. And then this one is going to be the plus. I'm going to cut it right about here. There. 
So I'll run the plus down through here. Still in camera, that's good. And we'll put this one here. over here they don't really have any way to fasten this down I guess they figure the wires will hold it in place so if it's okay for them then it's okay for me again this is just fun this is not a mission critical piece of equipment and there goes the insulation I figured that was gonna happen let's see if we can slide it back on There we go. Okay. Very good. We'll pop that down on there, like so. This one we can trim down. And there we go. Yeah, I guess that does hold it on pretty good. It's not bad. Okay. And then we'll just do something like that to neaten it up just a little bit. There we go. Okay. Now these other two are where you, I think you can bring in an auxiliary 12 volt supply in there if we want. But not, not necessary. Okay. Is all attached and they want you to glue glue it down but they don't give you glue but I have glue so let's get the glue okay our quick hold glue somehow I don't think we need a whole lot of this, this should work a little glob in there. Probably too much. But you know what they say, the bigger the blob, the better the job. This is a quick hold. I buy this at the uh, craft store where my wife goes for things. Craft stores are really handy for people like us because the different types of adhesives and paints and uh, little brushes uh, little jewelry making tools which are really good for electronics as well you can buy all those things at very reasonable prices at some of those places so they're a uh, good place to go so I'm gonna hold this for a few minutes and then I'll come back all right well that glue finishes hardening up we're gonna get the base out and they want us to glue more glue glue this down on here. Now I'm going to try using CA glue because I think this is just acrylic and CA glue usually will stick pretty well to it. I don't know if there's a back. This looks like there's a backing paper on it. Try to peel that off. Oh. 
hard to get these things off of here. I'm sure some of you are screaming at the camera some different better methods to get this off of here than I'm using. <laughs> Please do. Don't just scream at the camera. Put your comment down there and let me know. I hate peeling these things off. I always have a hard time. My fingernails don't like getting in there. There we go. I don't think there's a top and bottom. They look the same from either side. So, let me peel this one and get this all ready. So, tomography. What is tomography? As we said, it's basically taking a radiograph on a flat plane, at least the type that I'm talking about. Now, the later type is called computed axial tomography. So, planar tomography, let's say we had a human body. This is our body. And I wanted to look at a kidney stone. Somebody may, we want to see if they have kidney stones. Your kidney is in the middle of your body, right? Very hard to see. And if you just do a flat x-ray, what's going to happen is all the anatomy above and below the kidney is going to be kind of blocking the view. So you're going to see all those things superimposed over one another and it makes it very hard to see something as small as a kidney stone. So what you really would like to be able to do is cut that person open <laughs> and remove a slice, almost like a piece of bread from a loaf of bread, and then look at it. And that's what tomography allows you to do. It's, it's done, it's pretty ingenious, it's simple, but when you think about it, if you take an x-ray straight down, it's going to project a shadow of the anatomy onto the detector or the film, whatever it is you're x-raying onto. And if you take that x-ray and you start at an angle and you sweep from one angle to another while the, the film is following it like this. So if I go f like this, the film is going to go like this. And it's the area, there's going to be an area so if you drew a straight line from the x-ray source to the detector, if I move the x-ray source and the detector like this, there is going to be a point around which that x-ray does not move. That fixed point is called your fulcrum point. So if I wanted to x-ray this part of the body, I would make my fulcrum point at that point and everything above and below that would be blurred out because you're moving, because of all the motion. But that center of that plane of rotation, that fulcrum point, is not going to be moving with respect to the x-ray. And therefore, it becomes much clearer. And that's what a tomogram is. Now, there's different forms of tomograms. The simplest one is called linear tomography. And that's where you just sweep the x-ray tube and the film, as I said, in a rotational direction like this. Now they found that you can get better blurring and even get a slight magnification and get more accuracy by moving that tube in a direction. So this, the next one they came up with was called a circular tomography. And it's the same thing, you still have a fulcrum point but now you're rotating this way and the film is following around and the x-ray tube is going around in a circle. And that's called circular tomography. Later on, they were able to improve it even more with tri-spiral tomography. And that is, you actually make a spiral pattern like that. You can make three rotations so it kind of swirls its way out like that. And that proved to be very good for inner ear studies. You could actually see the three inner ear bones, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, you could see very clearly using that tri-spiral tomography. Later on, they came up, the Philips Medical Company came up with another form of tomography called hypocycloidal. 
hypocycloidal, not hyper. And a hypocycloid is, if you ever had that game, the spirograph game <laughs> back in the day, where you had this ring with little teeth around the inside, and then you had these little round gears with holes in them, and you put your pencil in there and you followed it around and it would make neat little patterns. That's a hypocycloid. Well, the Phillips polytome, of which that little label is from, the polytome was capable of doing linear, circular, elliptical, which kind of gives you a longer field of view, and hypocycloidal. And hypocycloidal actually gave the clearest looking image. And uh, it was very, very good tomography back in the day. That was the predecessor to the axial tomogram, which is what you see today in a CAT scanner or CT. With a CT scanner, the patient is placed this way instead of this way. And the x-ray source goes all the way around the patient and the detector is opposite that tube so the source and the detector go around in a circle and they actually take a thin slice all the way around and that's that's also called a slice but instead of looking from a projection of this projection you're actually looking at this projection so it's like I took a slice of bread like this took that slice of bread out of the middle of you and then turned it you know like this and then turned it up and showed it to you so you could read it. And that's why CT slices look like a slice of bread almost. That's what CAT scans are. Now in order to do that you have to do a lot of mathematical functions because while that tube is rotating around the patient it's taking a whole bunch of images from many different angles and you have to electron or digitally add those all together and you have to average them and you actually use an FFT function to do that so it does fast Fourier translation or transform to create that slice out of all those projections so we can get into that you know the original version used back projection technology and things like that none of that's they don't use that now it's different <laughs> but just so you understand these linear and circular and hypocycloidal tomography units that were all mechanical and then later on were electromechanical that had you know tack feedback and stepper motors but were still very rudimentary based to this the image was still an analog image on a piece of film those were the predecessor to the CAT scanner now one of the bad things is to be able to see some of the things you needed to see you couldn't take a slice like this right you could only do that planar type and sometimes you had to put the patient in a you know, very uncomfortable position and you sometimes had to do things that caused a lot of discomfort to the patient and it's that some of them borderline barbaric so remember I said in that video that the polytome is a little bit has a little bit of notoriety in that it was in a movie the movie that it was in was The Exorcist. If any of you have ever seen The Exorcist, uh, in one of the scenes, they were trying to find out what was wrong with the little girl. And, uh, you know, the whole story is about that the girl gets possessed by the devil, you know. But the in the beginning, they were trying to find a medical explanation for it. And they were doing certain brain studies to see if she had some sort of a mental problem. And one of the studies they mentioned that they were doing was called the pneumoencephalogram. And pneumoencephalograms, you could actually do that study on a Phillips polytome, and they actually showed the Phillips polytome for just a couple seconds in the movie with the little girl in the machine. Now, if you watch that movie, that's not a very accurate depiction of a pneumoencephalogram because they just show her laying on the table with the machine, you know, making its little clover leaf pattern or the, the hypocycloid above her. But actually, a pneumoencephalogram is much worse than that. It, uh, and that's why they use that term because that's the most horrific study you could have done to you back then. What they did was they had a special attachment called a pneumo chair 
and it was an immobilizing chair that would attach to the x-ray machine and would kind of hold you in a bent over position with your kind of head down, back arched. And uh, the whole idea is they want to study the base of the, sp uh, where the spinal cord attaches to the base of the brain. And they actually have to cause that to separate. They'll inject uh, like a fluid or an air or something in there to push that open. So you can see uh, inside there and it is, you're awake when they do this and it's working on all your nerve endings. It is the most excruciating pain a human being can suffer. And uh, so that's why any of us who knew what that was when they said that, that movie, that scene in that movie had a whole different meaning for us. And luckily they didn't show her actually in the pneumo chair. They just showed her laying on the normal x-ray table of the machine. But that was in fact a real Phillips polytome. Now that was before my time that they did pneumoencephalograms. They stopped doing those and started doing CT. Because I started working in this industry in the 1980s and the earliest CTs were already being put to use at that time. But in the 70s they did do those studies. And uh, they weren't very common because there had to, be, it had to be a pretty severe problem you were trying to see. That was kind of a last ditch effort before you uh, would order that type of study on a patient. But absolutely, that is a real thing, the pneumoencephalogram. And you can look them up. I do believe there is some information online about pneumoencephalograms, what they are and what they study. Um, one of the in, one of the engineers that trained me uh, was a specialist for Phillips Medical, and he installed and serviced those uh, Phillips polytomes. And at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, here in the United States, they actually uh, they did have a pneumo chair and they did do pneumoencephalograms and he did actually have to sit in on a case uh, with a patient that was having that study done and he said it was the absolute worst thing he had ever experienced and he never wanted to see one of those again so if that gives you any idea but we have come such a long way in the field of medicine where a lot of these things that you know were so so barbaric you know they don't have to do them anymore because of modern imaging like the CT and the MRI and so forth just thought that'd be interesting uh, I may have a couple of images some because most of this was gone by the time cell phones with cameras came about so I don't have hardly any pictures and if you try to look at some of these old tomo units, like there's several out there, when, you know, the Phillips polytome is one of them, the CGR Stratomatic, it was a tri-spiral unit and it was enormous. It took up an entire room and shook the entire floor when it drove. The Picker Plurograph, the CGR Exatome. Uh, Siemens had two units that I, ser I serviced both of them, and I can't remember th their name. But they had two uh, s circular and elliptical units that they used. Um, so, all of these were, uh, you know, I did a lot of work on them back in the day, but I don't have any records of it, because again, uh, <laughs> they didn't have digital cameras back then. That's a relatively new thing, especially attached to your phone. So I have very little records, but there was a site where I installed a linear TOMO unit in a little hospital back in 1989. And I got called back into that hospital about three years ago and for something else to look at their CT. And as it turns out, they actually still had that machine there. It was just decommissioned because it had some problems and they didn't have any engineers that knew how to work on them anymore and they kind of lost touch with me. But uh, I actually took some pictures of it. So you, if I can find those pictures, I will post them up here. I'm missing one, it's in here. And uh, you can 
you can see at least a linear tomo unit. And if I can find some pictures of the to of the polytome, I'll see if there's one uh, from the web. I will try to put that up as well. And you can see what they looked like. Sometimes I feel a lot like a dinosaur because if you only knew how much training we had to go through to learn this equipment and how to work on it and how many years you had to apprentice under people and things to know this only to have this stuff become obsolete <laughs> and uh, all that knowledge is lost and uh, you know you'll, you'll never need it again it's interesting to talk about from a historical standpoint but it's kind of a lot of worthless effort I mean it helped a lot of people in its day so I don't regret learning it and doing it but it's kind of like what do I do with this knowledge you know <laughs> and then you forget a lot of it so if you find some place that for some reason has one still for some unknown reason and they call you to work on it well you were an expert on it well, yeah 30 years ago but when you, wait till you don't until you don't see something for 30 years and see if you can remember you know my mother brilliant woman she uh, went to school at IBM and learned how to program the mainframes she started out on an IBM system 3 she was the only female in the school when she went in the 1970s she was the only female in there really felt out of place and she persevered and became a, an amazing programmer and uh, a manager and so forth and uh, it's funny because she's 90 years old now and she and I'll sit down and we'll talk sometimes about those things because I used to go stand at her knee when she worked on these things in total awe of what she did and uh, I'll say hey Ma do you remember this and she's like I couldn't program that again if my life hinged on it she says I'm sure it would come back if I started working on it again but you know it's just been so many years you just forget it after a while and I get that. All right, we have these all glued in. Let's see what the next step is. Okay, next we have to make three turns of this wire, and this is going to be your primary coil. And they want it to start in the middle, like this, and they want it to curve this direction and they want you to make three turns with it. So I think what we're doing here, let's see if they have an image of it. Okay, I get it. So they have three turns starting at the center. So I'm gonna go, I wanna make sure this glue is set up. Let me give it a few more, well, give it a few more minutes for this glue to set up better and then we'll be back. All right, well this, finished drying I kind of went through and read this a little more carefully and what they want you to do is strip the ends of these and then attach this really thin wire which is really thin uh, onto either end of this and then they wanted it to wrap around but what I ended up doing was I just took a pin vise and I drilled a couple little holes here for the wires to go through to make it a little neater because what's going to happen is this is going to go up here and it's going to attach into these three sections. This part is going to go here, this wire goes through here and I'll put some heat shrink over that as well and it goes into this terminal right here. So what I'm doing right now is attaching and they want you to insulate where you tack the wires on. So I am attaching a little heavier piece of wire for the primary cable and I'm going to run it down in there and then it can attach and we'll put some more heat shrink on that as well so let me see about I need some really needly nose pliers here what did I do with them? Here's a pair. I have even thinner ones someplace, but oh, there they are. Buried, of course. Okay. 
I'm just going to make a tiny little loop to go on to the end. And then I'm going to bend it out this way, attach it over the end, like that. Get our soldering iron. Tack this on like this, hopefully while we're in frame with the camera. Then after we do that, we'll put this other piece of heat shrink on here. Like so. Actually, I'll use this little bit longer piece. I did have to glue the wires into the little holders so that it would stay stable. Let's put this on. Okay. without disrupting anything too much. Try to get this one to go down through here just the same as the other one. Just like so. And then I want to get this up over there like that. That's good. Just want to keep it insulated there. All right. Now this piece glues onto the base and we have to slide the wire. And I can do that with this mounted up here, I think. Like so. I think it'll be easier if everything holds together like this. So we'll put these on. And those little plastic standoffs just go on like this. So they had some longer ones of these screws and they threaded all the way through the bottom uh, all thread connectors and then protruded through the board and then threaded onto this. Kind of neat how they set this up. This is actually a neat little Tesla coil kit. It's very small, but it has all the major components of a real Tesla coil. And this is not one of those ones you can modulate with your MP3 player or whatever. It's just a Tesla coil. And all it will do is make sparks, but it will also demonstrate the principle of how these work. if it works. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not even testing anything until it's all together. Either it'll work or it won't. Again, this is just a fun time waster project. All right, so I'm going to take these and first and foremost, I'm just going to snip them to length, give them a little bit of extra length. And I'm going to strip these down. I'm going to put a couple pieces of heat shrink on there just to get us some extra insulation. And I'm going to fit this in just like so. How's that? Good. I'll do another one just the same.
just tack those in there and snip off all the excess and that'll be ready to go. I think that looks a lot better than how they had it. They just had the wires wrapping around the outside there of the base. I didn't like the way that looked. So let's put these down like this. We'll shrink them. And perhaps it will look like we at least somewhat know what we're doing. Okay. And these will electromagnetically couple with one another as well and act like part of the coil. So I don't want them moving around. That's why I kind of like the way this goes. You know, once these are in there, they'll hold relatively straight. And that'll keep that from changing too much. Because the more you change this mess around, the, because this is not a self-regulating coil, the more it'll change the resonant frequency and this thing won't be working at its peak. As it is, you can't really tune it because you only have two choices. You'd be better off with an actual spark gap in there. But uh, we don't have such a thing at our disposal, so we're going to have to make do with what we have. And I'm gonna put a little bit of glue on here, and hopefully this will hold. I don't know. If this doesn't work, we'll have to use that other stuff. But hopefully this will work. I'm just going to put some weight on this. I'll put this up there. That'll hold it down while it dries, and hopefully. Well, here is the completed Tesla coil. And before we get on with it here and test it out, uh, some comments. First of all, after you finish the completing the uh, assembly, they have a schematic at the end, and they also have some pictorial diagrams. And I went through and I checked everything very carefully, and I found out that I did make a mistake that these wires, I had to switch them around. So the terminal here that says in, I don't know if you can see that, right there where it says in, that's the inside part of the winding of the primary coil. Out is the outside of the primary coil winding and L2 is your number your secondary coil it comes in there so I had a couple of those wires swapped around so I put them in the correct place I'm glad I checked that this is on this side this represents your spark gap and these are just as I said earlier these are spark arresters you can buy these things. They're used for uh, surge protectors and so forth. One of them will draw an arc at 3,000 volts and the other one at 3,500 volts. And this really takes the place of the spark gap in, in here. Now there's a lot of problems with using this. We'll get into that in a minute. Other than that, yes it has a switching primary power supply, but that really doesn't much matter. Uh, this would work the same almost as a neon sign transformer as far as just providing the high voltage. There are some differences, but again, we'll look at that here in a minute. After going through this, I see a couple of problems with this, some things that concern me that I don't like. First of all, this is an 8,000 volt 10 nanofarad capacitor. That is a lot of energy. Now, 
you have to understand this power supply is going to put out, and we, we're going to measure it. I'm going to get a meter out so we can measure it. And I'm going to remove the spark gap while we do that. And you're going to see there is going to be several thousand volts across this capacitor. Now, this can be very dangerous, and it can. this is not something I would consider good for somebody just learning electronics. It is extremely dangerous. Yes, this is a power supply. Uh, this high voltage supply is current limited quite a bit. But you have to understand, this capacitor isn't. <laughs> So when, this, when the high voltage primary supply right here puts the voltage in here, this capacitor will charge up. So even though the actual wattage that this thing outputs is relatively low, the amount of joules of energy that can be stored in this capacitor is relatively high. You know, 10 nanofarads at, let's say, 3,500 volts it's probably going to go maybe even above that if this if this spark gap works correctly that is quite a bit of power that is a lot of power and if you get across this capacitor it will majorly hurt you especially if you get it across your chest using both hands so we have to use the the one hand rule when we work with this it's very dangerous if you touch this spark gap while it's charged up you will discharge that capacitor this spark gap you're going to see is right in line with this capacitor. I'll show you the schematic here in a minute. So this is no joke. Uh, this is not something I would want to play with if I didn't know uh, or wasn't comfortable with working with high voltages. When you look at some of those little Slayer exciter co uh, coils and so forth. Okay, the phone rang. What was I saying? <laughs> anyway, um, we're going to have to be really careful with this the way this works because of this spark gap being right out in the open like this and this on this side being open as well. So not a toy by any means. Uh, what I want to do before we do anything, I'll, we'll look at the schematic and we'll also look at the original patent by Nikola Tesla from 1891 and we'll see a couple of the differences uh, that we have in here and we'll talk about those. So let's do that and then let's pull this spark gap and let's see if we can apply some voltage. Oh, I know what else it was. The other problem is there is no, uh, there is no RF suppression coil on this at all. What does that mean? Well, when this thing starts to fire off, you can actually have back EMF feedback through this primary circuit and it can cause a pretty high current pulse on your power supply, your 12 volt, because they want 12 volts going into it. So unless you have just a basic non-regulated linear power supply, you could run the risk of damaging, a, for instance, a programmable power supply. So we're not going to use our bench good power supplies. I'm going to take out that old transformer that we used in the previous video before this one and we're just going to make a really quick linear power supply. I'll show you how to <laughs> couple components and we're going to hack it together because this is not a permanent thing on the bench just to give us voltage that we don't care about. It's, we're not going to hurt anything here. Okay. So here's the schematic for this thing. And uh, let's get our lightsaber out because I like it. <laughs> so here, this represents that high voltage module. And it's, they're saying 200 kilohertz, zero amps. What they're saying is that this is, this is a high frequency switch mode power supply. And it's going to output however many volts. I'm going to estimate it's got to be in excess of 3,500 volts or that, that spark gap won't work. Um, they rectify this to DC, okay, it goes through this high voltage diode, so this is like a high frequency power supply. They turn it into a half wave uh, rectified high voltage supply. And the whole purpose of this supply is to charge this capacitor. Now, original power, the, a Tesla coil can run on AC or DC, it really doesn't care, but you just need enough current within a half cycle <laughs> 
to charge this capacitor all the way up to its full amount. And of course, since this is current limited, you can't do that. So they're turning it into DC. You're charging this capacitor up over multiple pulses until finally you get enough voltage for this, uh, for the discharge gap to break down. This is really not the correct, a good way to do this with this particular power supply. Um, unless this could deliver the proper amount of current because what's going to happen is this well it will work this way but this capacitor is going to charge and that's going to hold this voltage across here low until the voltage builds up far enough with enough pulses in here to be above the the break point of this uh, spark gap spark gap will spark it will short out this primary circuit here and create a loop through here in this direction okay right through here and this is where you will get your tank circuit action so the action between the 10 nanofarad cap and this coil whatever whatever its arbitrary inductance is will create an oscillator circuit and the idea is we want this circuit to oscillate at the same frequency that this was resonant at. And if we remember, we checked this coil here, this secondary coil, which is, if remember, it's this one up here. It needs to be, it was somewhere, what, what was I, what did I say it was? Around five megahertz or four and a half, 5.5 megahertz, 5.6, something like that. So we want this circuit right here to resonate at that frequency, at that five megahertz. Let's just round it up to that, round it off to five megahertz. So if this is resonating at 5 megahertz and driving this coil at 5 megahertz, you'll, you'll be in resonance and you'll get maximum output from this. Now, there's several ways to do that, okay? If it's close enough, we can just adjust this spark gap. And when we get this spark gap uh, adjusted far enough, it'll, it'll make and break at the appropriate time to get that 5 megahertz going on. If not, you have to adjust L1. Normally what they do is on the primary coil here, they'll put some taps along here. So you'll be able to, for instance, disconnect the wire from here and move it around here until you get it right into that resonance point and adjust the inductance on this coil. Now, of course, this is a rudimentary design. It doesn't have that. So to make matters worse, they have a fixed spark gap. So we only have two options for spark gap. So what's going to happen with this thing is you have a limited power supply with current limited that's going to slowly charge this capacitor up. So this thing's just going to sit here while this thing charges. As it charges up, we'll finally get to a break point. It'll snap over. You'll get a snap in here. And for just a split second while it's doing that, you'll get a little bit of resonance and you'll get a little pulse out to here and you'll get one spark. Then the whole process is going to start all over again. Now normally this happens in a very rhythmic pattern and you, you get a continuous you know, stream of pulses out of there. You're not going to get that from this Tesla coil. You would have to majorly change this to, to be something in here to be adjustable. So really what we're going to need to do is put in an adjustable spark gap at the very least, and maybe even adjust this a little bit to get it to work properly. Now, there's two different places that you can put the spark gap on these. This is the correct, the mostly accepted way of doing it. So what you have is you have your power supply coming in, your primary supply, and you have the spark gap in parallel with that. And then you have it feeding the capacitor and the coil in series like that. The other way to do it would be to put the capacitor where the spark gap is, put the spark gap up here, and put the coil across this way. So the spark gap is only breaking the connection to the coil and the capacitor is charging. Either way can work, but when you have it that other way around with the spark gap here, you have to figure in if this is a, like a your power supply transformer, you have to figure this whole part of the circuit in for the resonance point. And in addition, you have to have a current limited, like an air gapped 
uh, transformer feeding this or when this thing shorts out you're putting a dead short across that and you will damage your transformer so you need a special transformer to do that that's why they usually use neon sign transformers for the primary of this now if we go and look at the original patent from Nikola Tesla okay this is just a drawing and this is patent number 454622 and I believe it's from 1891 here's a here's your generator that generates your mains voltage it goes into a similar to what we would call a neon sign transformer today so you have a low voltage here primary and a high voltage secondary which is going to be several thousand volts you can see they have the capacitor in parallel with the output of the the secondary of the driver transformer then you have the spark gap as I showed you so they have the configuration with the spark gap here and the capacitor here and then here's your primary coil see that so when this closes here's your loop but notice if this closes off so when this when this draws an arc this acts like, like a short and if this is shorted you've just put this coil this capacitor and this secondary all in parallel so as this capacitor discharges and as this is trying to feed this you for a short split second while this arc is here you're shorting out this coil right here because remember this is only a couple turns of wire it's very very low resistance and, and actually low inductance too and so when compared to this this better be an air gap transformer <laughs> with current limit or you're going to damage this transformer now with the other way around you're also going to have that same problem in that but it's going to be a little bit different because normally if you if you shorted this out the way our schematic is shown and this is the way that most people make Tesla coils now it will short out this this winding right here but that takes that out of the circuit and now you just have this loop right here and it takes this out of the equation for when you're calculating your resonance for that it will work either way is what I'm saying but you have to have the correct components for it to work that's all I'm trying to say alright so with all that in mind let's build up our power supply and uh, take this spark gap out I'm gonna take that out before I forget because I don't want to charge this cap I don't even want to turn this thing on with this in here like this yet and we're going to connect our power all right hopefully we can see everything here let's get some stuff so we have a capacitor two diodes some random wires that I found in my wire box and our transformer and I'm not even going to fix a mains cord on here I'm just going to use this cheater cord that has some alligator clips and kind of an inline fuse with a plug we're going to go really <laughs> how you doing on this okay again this is just a temporary thing we're going to knock together to uh, to try this out so I have a couple of what are these 1N 5408s and I am not going to put any suppressor coils on this uh, I think we'll be okay and, but what I will do is I will connect this to my current limiting bulbs but I'll put a big one like you know a 300 or 400 watt bulb on there but that that bulb will take up any real excessive arcing you know or uh, back EMF or anything from this so I'm not really worried about it and it'll go back into my isolation transformer so we're gonna have lots and lots of suppression so we don't get a bunch of RF out onto our mains which is what I really don't want that would not be fun it's not the right way to do it what you should have is you should have a couple of uh, coils on here to suppress that but for the little bit of time this is not going to be a, 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 pro, a item that I'm going to use very often if at all after this video 
So it's really not super safe and not very practical the way it's designed. So I'm not going to get too excited over <laughs> making anything permanent. Okay, and I'm not going to worry about the size of the wire that I use or anything because, again, this is just a temporary thing. This is very undersized power wire, but again, this is only going to, the, the nominal current on this is only going to be around 2 amps maximum. There will be some surge current, but again, we don't care. All right. So, is this scary enough for all of you yet? <laughs> Sometimes you just got to get the job done. Okay. So there's our rectified power right there. And I'll put a little bit of distance on it. Snip this onto here. I'll make them similar length. What the heck? Make it a little easier so I don't have so many wires. And here's our minus. And this is a 22,000 microfarad at 16 volts. Just like so. So that should give us some pretty good filtration. And remember, this is uh, 8 volts. This is 16 volt center tap, so it's 8 volts from here to here. If you take 1.414 times that 8 volts, that's the peak voltage that's going to be across this capacitor. So it's not going to be really very high. Okay, so the 16 volt cap should be just fine. Okay. I don't remember these big caps. We had them a long time ago using for a big power supply that we used to work on it, you know, that I used to use at work and uh, no longer, no longer is being used out there, I don't think. There might be a few old ones floating around out there. It's just amazing how much electronic gear, you know, in the medical industry, once it becomes obsolete, <laughs> there's just no use for it other than historical purposes. Although these caps are used everywhere. I mean, this is, this is a pretty common capacitor out there, but I just had a few of them, so I thought I would use it from other projects and things. So there's our mains connection, and there's our power supply. <laughs> That's it. I mean, that is about the simplest full wave power supply you can make right there. There it is. Quick and easy. And I'm not even going to connect a barrel connector to this, although I could, huh? Why don't we do that? I have one here. So we'll put a barrel connector on it. I could just, there is, there are terminals that I can solder directly onto, but I'm not going to try that. I'll just, because then I have to unsolder it. This is easier. We can just plug this in and unplug it. And you'll see what I'm doing. All right. Again, feel free to skip ahead anytime you want on this, because all I'm going to do here is solder these on. You can watch or not. Okay. And then this one. I'm going to snip down just a little more because it's a little bit shorter. I'll just go like this. Just like so. And 
And really the best thing to do would be to put some heat shrink on there, but I'm not going to do it. Again, this is temporary. Okay. And then I'll go over here. my cutters. Snip that off. Crimp the little strain relief. High speed power supply building, huh? Okay. Again, I don't want to use one of my good power supplies, bench power supplies on this because they're all regulated and current limited and all that and they'll just, I don't think it would work very well. Even if it did, it, it may damage something and I just don't want to do that. Okay, there's our power supply. It plugs in like that. And I'm going to turn the power switch on here. And then I am going to go over to my current limiting station over here. I'm going to have it on limit. I'm going to turn that on. So I got 300 watts bulb in there. And I'm going to plug this in, turn it on. So, and then I can turn the power on from this switch over here. Okay. Now, next thing I want to do is get an old meter that can deal with this kind of voltage. I do have some high voltage probes and things, but let's see what else I have. I'll be right back here. See if I can reach. Uh, yep, here's an old meter. Okay, this is another triplet 630, but it's an old one that has not been restored yet. It needs to be the, the switches and everything, and I don't know, pretty, pretty stiff. So we'll set it on the 5,000 volt scale. This can read up to 5,000 volts. And, uh, We'll connect a set of wires. I highly doubt this is going to go above 5,000 volts. And even if it does, uh, look, DC volts, here we go. Even if it does, and I think this is going to be, we'll see what happens. Okay, let me, let's make sure, every, well, before we do that, let's make sure our power supply works. <laughs> Being a little, getting a little bit ahead of myself here. So, we'll flip the switch. All right, that's a good sign. And let me go from here to this go down to volts, go down to 10, make sure our meter works. Let's see. 10, we got about 11 volts, 11 and a half volts on there, so that's good. So that's perfect. And under load, that'll drop, of course. So let's turn that off. <coughs> And of course, what do we have on there? We still have 11 volts because we have a 22,000 microfarad capacitor. So even with the power turned off and unplugged, you can see it's still holding that charge. <clears throat> so I'm going to discharge it before I plug it into this thing. All right, so I'll just clip this on the outside, touch this on the inside, and that'll drain it down through my little discharge cord that I made. I think I've shown this in multiple videos. <clears throat> it's just a resistor with a discharge rod. Okay. <clears throat> Minimal voltage. Okay. 
So let's plug this in. Let's go back to our 5,000 volts DC and hope I don't plug it in backwards. Well, if we do, we do, huh? All right. And let's see what we get. This is real time, guys, so I don't know what's going to happen. We're going to find out. Wrong way. Okay, so let's flip it around. <laughs> there. And if you notice, just connecting the meter is enough to drain the capacitor, just the, the impedance of the meter itself. Because this is not a high current power supply, and you know, it's a 10 nanofarad cap, but it's still going to be a good amount of voltage on there. Oh, yeah, look at that. So, on the 5,000 volt scale, we have about 4,300 volts, which I would expect it to be close, you know, close to 4,000 because, again, they gave us these 3,500 volt spark arresters. So, our primary power supply is now working. So, all that I did was I removed this discharge gap. So it's just like taking these two wires out of the circuit and that just allows it to charge this capacitor right through this coil right here. And we're never interrupting it with a spark. So it functions. Now I want to make sure before I touch anything that there is absolutely no possibility of voltage being there because you just saw <laughs> The 10 nanofarads at 40, 4,300 volts, you can do the calculation for how many joules of energy that is. It's a lot. And it, it will wrap you hard. I mean, I've been shocked off of, off of this type of capacitor before, and it hurts. I mean, it hurts. It feels, like, it, it feels like somebody hitting you with a hammer. I mean, it hurts. So we want to be careful. And never get it across your chest, whatever you do. Okay, we know this is good, so let's get the meter out. I'm going to clean this meter up and restore it one day. I love these triplet 630s. They're my favorite. There's probably three or four different variants of the meter. And I just think these are, anytime I get a really good deal on one that's in working order, I'll snap it up, even if it's just for parts, because they're, they're just so handy to have and so versatile. I mean, even compared to the uh, Simpson 260s, which are also fantastic meters. But uh, I really like those triplet 630s. Okay, let's put in our spark gap, and I think we're going to start with the 3500 volt one. That's going to give us a little bit slower spark, and it's probably going to give us a little harder output as well. And that just plugs right in here, according to the schematic. Okay, just like that. I'm going to plug this in. All right. And let's see what we get out of this thing. I'm going to shut the lights out. And I don't know if we're going to get any sparks out of this thing or not, but let's just shut some lights out and see what we get. What should happen is this spark gap should should light up. You should see little flashes in there and you might even hear it snap and you should see some corona around there coming out and I don't have the top cap on yet so again this is all <laughs> we're just starting out so let's see what happens. There it goes and I don't see any oh yeah if you look down there it was leaking. We were getting, we were actually getting corona. We were getting an arc from here to there. So we definitely have to fix that. You know, let me do it one more time so you can see it. I'll show you. I'm going to zoom in right down here in the bottom. And you tell me if you can see there was an arc right down, right down in here, which is bad. See it? 
So that's not good. Now this thing's still energized. I have the power turned off from the power supply, but if you notice back here, the LED, let's see here, you can just see that LED is still lit. So I have to unplug this and there is probably still some residual charge on there. So let's turn lights back on. Okay. So I'm thinking we're going to have some residual charge on there. So one hand rule, I'm going to put one hand behind my back. And while I'm doing this, and I'm going to touch this on here, and that's just going to ensure that this capacitor is bled down before we touch anything. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is see if we can isolate some of that arcing because it shouldn't be arcing down there like that. And I think what I'm going to try is I'm going to try a little piece of capped on tape. Let me see if I can find some here and uh, see if we can insulate this a little bit more. This actually has some acrylic on the, like a, an acrylic mylar uh, covering on the outside of the coil already. But it's still arcing as you saw. Just, part of it is because we're not, I don't think we're properly resonant. But let's get some insulation. Okay. And this stuff is relatively thin. But uh, it should help a little bit with this. I'm going to just put a couple, couple line, a couple turns of the tape on here just to try to give it a little bit of insulation. And then I'm going to put another piece of tape across the top here over that coil. And I know it looks really janky like that, but this will help possibly reduce that possibility of that arcing. And you know, it's it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole with these coils like this. If it's not properly insulated, you insulate one spot and you'll stop the arc in one place and just cause it to show up in another place. <laughs> and that's essentially what you're doing and, and you just, you never, it's never right. Okay. Let's go back a little bit. I'll plug this back in. Everything's turned off. So, and let's power it back up. Let me shut the light off. See if it gets any better now. Nope, it's still doing it. Right through the capped on tape, like it's not even there. Did you see that? So, we're probably going to have to put some silicone or something over there to really uh, properly isolate it. So, we can't. So I'm going to do that, and then we'll let it cure, and then we'll come back and try it some more. Okay, while we're waiting for the silicone to dry, or to cure, uh, here's just a quick, <laughs> just a, a quick uh, schematic of that simple power supply we knocked together. So here's your transformer, there's your primary, there's your center tap secondary, and of course from the center tap to this end you have some volts, from the center tap to this end, you have some volts. You run them both through your full, full wave rectifier, which is your two diodes. And that's going to give you a positive and negative here with respect to ground. And at the end, you're going, because this is capacitor is going to charge up to the peak voltage, which is the, uh, the peak of whatever this sum volts is, you'll have some volts times 1.414 because these this AC voltage here is measured in RMS. So that gives you an idea and uh, of what you're getting there. So it's very simple. Two diodes, a capacitor, and a transformer, and you have a power supply. All right, it is the next day, and I, the goop is dry, but I don't know that that's going to help a whole lot. We'll see what happens. The problem is, again, the spark gap is not correct for this. So we'll try the other one after we try this, but let's see. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. I just taped this little pin on here to see if we can get some discharge off of that. So let's shut the light off. And let me turn this on and let's see what happens, I guess.
Yeah, see it's sparking up the sides of the coil. And we're not getting anything. Well, we're getting a little bit of corona at the at the pin head, but we're getting a lot more arcs from the bottom. And that's probably because, again, we're not anywhere near resonance on this. So let's try the other spark gap, although I think it's going to be the same situation. It's not going to help with anything. So let's get some lights on. Let me discharge this. And uh, I'm sure we'll get a nice little snap out of this. Yep. There we go. Okay. And I'm going to unplug this. Even though it's turned off. We'll put this one in. We'll just see if this makes any difference. I don't think it will. I mean, it's kind of working, but not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. Lights out. And let's see if we can pick something up on our camera now. Let's see what we get. Yeah, it's not not we're getting anything now. Do you notice there's no absolutely no sparks at all. So it liked that other one better. Okay, that's all you're going to get. <laughs> um, so what we did was we just made a little makeshift spark gap. There's a lot of problems with this. Uh, did you see for the moment that it did that, you got a corona at the end of this pin and we really didn't, you know, tape it down or anything like that. And then all of a sudden the spark went away. And that's because of the, the heat and the plasma that, that builds up in here in this spark gap because I just have two little pieces of wire. And if I touch those together, that should short out the capacitor, which we definitely want to do. Uh, so this will work if you had a proper spark gap in here, and it needs to probably be a quenched spark gap, meaning you at least need to blow some air over it to, first of all, to cool the electrodes, and second of all, to uh, remove the, the plasma that's around there and replace it with fresh air. And because if anytime you change that in between the spark gap, it changes the properties uh, of how that spark will break down. Remember, this is acting almost like a semiconductor. So, really, what needs to happen to make this work properly is to get a proper spark gap. And if you look at the instructions that come with it, uh, after they have you play with these little, these, you know, spark arresters, then they show you how to use a couple of copper spheres that you buy from a jewelry store, and you make a, uh, a, a set of electrodes. And then they have you take those little jewelry spheres, those little brass spheres, and drill a little tiny hole in there, and then install a little piece of rod or a pin or something like that make some holders and if you followed along with me on that download that I gave you this you know earlier in the video this website here you can see what I'm talking about and then you make an actual adjustable spark gap and that's really what this thing's going to need in order to adjust it properly and even with that you're going to need an you know some sort of an air quench uh, thing like a little compressor, or a little fan to blow on there or something. And uh, it would even be better yet if we could have an adjustable primary coil too, where we could kind of move the tap around, like strip some of this off and make a, a little alligator clip that we could clip around there. That A lot of the co bigger coils have that. That'd be kind of difficult with this little tiny one. But anyway, I'm going to end this project right here because this was just supposed to be a time waster, remember? And uh, just having some fun at the bench uh, before the holidays here. So I'm going to uh, end this extremely long 
and uh, kind of useless video. And I'm going to end it, as always, by wishing you this time a very blessed and Merry Christmas, a Happy Holidays, whatever it is you celebrate. I hope that it, it's the best for you. And here's to a good new year for all of us. And as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And I hope that one day that we can all desire that same thing for one another, because when we do, we will change the world for the better. Take care, everybody, and have a great holiday. Bye-bye.